The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, tarting humans up for space with nanosurgery. Immoral Immortals and Ethereal Ephemera. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with Larry Correa. He discusses the new book he's co-authored with John Ringo. It's the second entry in the Monster Hunter Memoirs series. These are books set in Larry's Monster Hunter universe, but set back in the 1980s. It's a sort of a historical novel now, if you will. This one is set in 1980s New Orleans, and it's called Monster Hunter Memoirs Sinners. Larry will talk about that and about the new mainline Monster Hunter novel he's working on, yay, and other great upcoming projects. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now here's the news. We have new free fiction and nonfiction at the Bain.com front page. Check it out. We have a short story. It's really a novella from uh, Robert Butner, set in the world of his new near-future thriller, The Golden Gate. Bob Butner is a really good short story writer, by the way. Not all novelists are, but Bob really knows how to knock them out of the park. This one is called The Trouble with Millennials. The story is about Peter Dial, a millennial. A millennial is one of a tiny percentage of people destined to live until the ripe old age of 1,000 or even beyond. Once the rich and famous started to extend their lives indefinitely, the masses started to get jealous, don't they always? And now it's been over 100 years since the procedure was outlawed, and millennials have gone into hiding. So how did Vijay Patel, the guy that invented the process, track Pete down for a mysterious job repairing and flying an antique airplane? Where exactly is Patel planning to escape to with this airplane, and who is he running from? To find the answers, Pete will have to risk shortening his lifespan considerably, as in perhaps to instant death. Our nonfiction is from neuroscientist Dr. Robert E. Hampson. This one is called Homo Stellaris. Becoming the People of the Stars. If human beings are going to leave this lovely mud ball we call home and travel out into the galaxy, we're going to have to adapt, perhaps in our very physical being, says Robert Hampson. In this piece, he examines what forms humanity might take to become Homo Stellaris. Homo Stellaris, Becoming the People of the Stars, and The Trouble with Millennials are now available on the front page at Bain.com. After that, they'll be available in two free ebooks at uh, Bain eBooks, Free Short Stories 2016 and Free Nonfiction 2016. They'll be the last entries in those eBooks, by the way, and then we'll start next year. So check those out. I want to welcome Larry Correa to the podcast. Hey, Larry. Also with us today is Bain Publisher and my boss, Tony Weiskopf. Hi, Tony. Hi, everybody. Larry Correa is the creator of the New York Times best-selling Monster Hunter International series, or Monster Hunter series, including Monster Hunter International, Monster Hunter Vendetta, Monster Hunter Alpha, Monster Hunter Nemesis and Legion, as well as the creator of the Magic Noir-themed... Um, Grimdor Chronicles, which includes Hard Magic, a novel we've serialized in audiobook form here on the podcast. Larry is also the author of Son of the Black Sword, book one in the Forgotten Warrior Saga, which is a high fantasy. He's the, or epic fantasy, I guess. He's the co-author with Mike Coopery of The Dead Six, three books in that series, um, the latest of which is Alliance of Shadows. And Larry's been an accountant, part owner of a gun store, a shooting instructor, a competitive shooter, He grew up in California and lives in Utah with his family. And now with co-author John Ringo, Larry is the co-author of the Monster Hunter Memoir series, including Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge, which was out last summer, 
And now at booksellers everywhere with the giant naked mole rat on the cover, which my son recognized from the, the giant blow up this morning when I was reading it. <laughs> Monster Hunter Memoirs, Sinners. So Larry, for those still living in unenlightened times, can you give us a quick rundown of the premise of, of all these books, the Monster Hunter books? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the, the basic idea is Monster Hunter International is a company uh, that hunts monsters professionally. They uh, collect bounties from the government. Uh, they take contracts they, to handle monster problems. And so basically the, the premise is it's, a, um, uh, it's an urban fantasy series where monsters are real. They live in secret amongst us. And the, uh, we have certain ways of dealing with them. And these guys are the professionals. Um, unlike a lot of urban fantasy, which tends to be more uh, romance-oriented, this is definitely action-adventure-oriented. Shoot them up. Uh, my background is military contracting and gun nut stuff, so that's the uh, the angle we come at it. So we saw it's solving monster problems through the application of superior firepower. Yeah. And uh, series has been a lot of fun. We are... Uh, Five books into the regular series. I'm working on number six now. And then we got the Memoirs series, which is the, um, the spinoff series with John Ringo. Those are – the regular series is set in just uh, – it, it's contemporary set right now. And then the uh, Memoir series is set in different periods of time. Uh, these books with John are set in the 1980s, the, the mid-1980s, and it's, uh, from a different Monster Hunter's perspective. Uh, and the first of the Memoirs books takes place in Seattle. And then the the other two in the series take place in New Orleans. Yeah. Well, in this universe, uh, one key concept in the books that comes up a lot in memoir centers is uh, and elsewhere is Puff. What is that? How does that apply to? Uh... It's it, it's not Puff the Magic Dragon. It's something yeah. else. <laughs> no. So what it is the bounty system that the government uses to pay people for killing monsters is, is Puff, which stands for the Perpetual Unearthly Forces Fund. Uh, and it was started by Teddy Roosevelt when he was president because he had had monster encounters when he was a New York City police commissioner. So he understood the best way to take care of monsters was to incentivize regular people to take care of them. So Puff has been around a long time, and there's certain companies that make their living off of Puff, or a big part of their living off of Puff. And uh, so, yeah, and then it's the Professionally Unearthly Forces Act is the basic law that governs the management of monster populations so uh like i said my background is military contracting so i had to know all this law stuff and so i kind of just uh, <laughs> i kind of just moved <laughs> that over into monsters uh same basic philosophies of management and uh <laughs> yeah it's a lot of fun one of my favorite things is people always find weird stuff on my fan page uh Monster Hunter International Hunters Unite over on Facebook is what it's called. People are always finding weird monsters on the internet or movies or TV shows uh, or folklore, and they'll put up a link and like, what's the puff on this? It's <laughs> ending joke of, uh, what is it worth to shoot this thing? And, and the idea behind it is that the more dangerous the monster or the more of a threat to society the monster is, the, the bigger the bounty. Well, and, um, and, and, and you know that there's some government bureaucrat who's, you know, following along that Facebook page and having to calculate what these puffs are. <laughs> yeah, and then and Ringo introduced uh, the concept in the third, uh, the third book, it's not out yet, of memoirs, of a puff adjuster, which is a, <laughs> wait, was, is a government agent whose job specifically is, is that. It's uh, that. And I did a little Halloween joke thing one time because main character of the Monster Hunter series is a former accountant. That, that was his background before he went into monster hunting. And so he's, he goes through and explains all the tax paperwork you have to, you have to know, you have to fill out. And so it's the, it's the 1040X, so it's the X-Files is where the X-Files comes from. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I knew there was a conspiracy within the <laughs> well, One of the big premises of, of the series is that nobody – that monsters are, are are hidden from the regular population so it really is our world in in some ways at least and oh the, yeah we uh I, I i take a lot of like historical things that happened and i and i tweak them around to have a monstrous explanation uh one of the fun things of the series and we get into this a little we haven't talked about this yet but there's an anthology of short stories coming up soon from a bunch of different authors and one of the things that was kind of fun about that is all the different authors had ideas um, from different periods of history. 
because the Monster Hunter series, we make, I'm a history nut, and so I, I just like to squeeze in real history whenever I can. And so, uh, you know, we had a story in there from Brad Torgerson about Benjamin Franklin dealing with monsters. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's all these little different historical things, and I get back into, you know, Vietnam and World War II. Um, you know, like in the current one I'm working on right now, Monster Hunter Siege, I've got all these references to Cold War era things that happen. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a big world and, uh, you know, basically just made it so that monsters have always kind of played a part in it. And, and I guess this, not just monsters, but like the supernatural, uh, into things. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of fun uh, with that in the series. Oh yeah. There's, I mean, and it's not a humorous series, but there's a lot of humor in this, um, um, Oh yeah, oh, yeah totally. It, it's, it's not a comedy, but, um, one of the things I learned in, in my own life is when you're working with guys, the more dark and dangerous their job is, the better developed their sense of humor tends to be. Um, and so there's a lot of gallows humor and a lot of, a lot of dark humor and just a lot of sar- sarcasm and, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta take the laughs when they come. And so I figured these guys, you know, they kill monsters for a living. So they're going to have either a really messed up sense of humor or, or other coping mechanisms. And so I've set it up so the series that the, the monster hunter people tend to be pretty funny. And the main character is, um, he's kind of a sarcastic guy. He's kind of a jackass, which makes him a lot of fun to write. <laughs> but... Yeah, no, so it's not a comedy, but I do squeeze a lot of comedic elements in there. And Well, you know, I, I, I think Larry's right. I think, you know, real life has uh, comic relief. Um, and, and it, it, Oh, totally. If you, if yeah, you, totally. I mean, honestly. You, if you, and, 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 and if you have stories that are just deadly serious without any kind of um, uh, outlet, um, it's actually not mimetic in any way. Um, that's just not how people work. Um, so I, I think Larry's approach actually is much closer to, uh, to reality. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so much fun to be in that universe is because it feels so very, very real. Yeah. If you made a story, if you wrote the story really dreary, it, it becomes kind of unrelenting and uh, that's a hard read. It's a, it's a hard slog. So you gotta have, even in your even in like your darkest moments, you gotta have these little brief glimmers of humor. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, absurd, you know? Ham- Hamlet has has comic relief. You know, if Hamlet is allowed to have comic relief, then I think you are too. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, because that is that is some dark Shakespeare right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's a it's 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 great stuff, and it's it's not one note. It's it's many notes sounding at once. It's good writing. Um, one of the things, speaking of good writing, one of the things I really like about the Monster Hunter books is that you use locales that aren't always L.A. or New York or, or some generic small town. You, you really pay attention and use settings really well. Um, centers. No, I, I, I think, I think honestly a good setting is almost a character. Absolutely. Um, Sinners is set in New Orleans. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the setting of, of Memoir Sinners to, to start? Let's talk about that book a little bit and then maybe expand out. Sure. Now, that one is that one is pure John because uh, New Orleans is one of the cities in the U.S. that I have not been to. Um, I've, been to I've been to 45 states. <laughs> I mean, I've been all over the place, but I have never been to New Orleans, actually. And so um, – all the geographic stuff and character of New Orleans, that's, that's from John. And so as I was editing it and he's talking about like street names and getting from this place to that place, I was thinking, I, I don't know. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I got to trust you on this one. Well, you're, you're oh, going to be, yeah. you're going to be going to New Orleans, uh, next year in your uh, book tour for Siege. So. Yep. So I, I will be in New Orleans in August. That will be the first time I've ever visited. And my plan is to eat food the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a local cuisine kind of guy, and that's one of those food cities, you know. So. Uh, oh, it really is. You'll be ready. You're you're gonna have a great time. It's going to be very hot. I'm just gonna warn you now. <laughs> it, was, it was like you know what? I'm, I'm pretty brilliant. So like like uh, last time I had an October book tour. So. I did all these northeastern stops, and the next one, I'm doing like Texas and Louisiana in August. Nice. 
It'll be great. But I, I, I'm pretty sure the giant mole rats have been taken care of, though. So it's just the, it's just the giant. Oh, yeah, yeah. They cleaned they clean out the giant mole rats. Um, okay. So that problem taken care of. They take care of the giant voodoo frogs. Mm. Uh, we should be good. The uh, No, but a lot of the New Orleans stuff, that, that I'm just ca- counting on John. And he has a real fondness for it. So uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's good. Uh, previous one, he did Seattle. And I've been to Seattle several times. Um, and uh, that's an interesting city. And uh, it had a lot of scenes just set around the Pacific Northwest. Oh, it did cause some confusion, though, because we, we had a town that he used, a real town, but he killed most of the people in it. So I changed the name to a, a fictional town, which, unfortunately, it turned out that I picked the name of a town that was a real town. Oh. That's <laughs> some confusion. Uh, sorry about that. That's on me. Uh, now, and the main series takes place in Alabama, you know, and then... Uh, I've used other weird locations. I've used Upper Michigan, like the, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. That was a lot of fun. Um, and it's funny because I've never actually, I've never, that was another place I've never been, but I did a bunch of research. And I had a bunch, I had a, like, a local newspaper up there ran a review of Monster Hunter Alpha, and they're like, Larry Korea must have lived here or spent summers here or something because he really nailed it. <laughs> yeah. And well, I was like, great. That, that, so that actually, is... what it was is Mike Coopery is from there. And so uh, I just used Mike Coopery mostly to bounce stuff off of to make sure that it felt right that plus one afternoon in a, in a meat movie. locker that would do it yeah <laughs> what uh tony and i tony partially and me completely are from northeast alabama and i felt like you really nailed it and that was so fun to see you changed the names around a little bit but i could i knew everywhere like desoto caverns and and such yeah I, ch- I changed. I changed a few names. Any any time I have a place where I slaughter a whole bunch of people, yeah, or nuke an old god, I yeah. <laughs> feel like I shouldn't leave it as a you know as the real name because that's not really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Personal thing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I, I love Alabama, and I spent a lot of time in Alabama, so I use that. I use Mississippi. I use the area around Corinth, Mississippi, northeastern Mississippi, because I lived up there. Um, I I don't know. I, I like using all these different areas in the books. I, I did a lot of, around uh, Monster Hunter Nemesis, I did a bunch of stuff around Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C., and I'd only been there once uh, to visit, so that was, um, I had to bounce various scenes of that off other people that actually lived there to make sure I got that right, but uh, I try, I try to get, I try to get, I try to be faithful to the, to the, to the area, because, you know, the people that live there really appreciate when you don't screw it up too badly. <laughs> yeah. Especially when it's somewhere that hardly ever gets in anything. Um, oh, it's, it's funny. I've never really, I haven't used Utah for much, even though I live here. Um, most fiction that's set here is all wrong. It's just so bad. Do you pick out the locales based on the monster you want to deal with, or does it just sort of happen all at once? Uh, it depends on the story. Um, you know, it just kind of depends on what the vibe is you're going for, and then I pick the place off the vibe. Like this current one, a lot of it's taking place in this... Um, it's actually the first time I've gotten really, truly international, despite the name of the company, and that I'm bouncing all over the world for this one, because we're leading up to a big mission. But the place where most of it uh, uh, occurs is... I really had to fabricate a lot of things, but because nobody really lives there, I, I can kind of get away with it. I, I figured not to. I'm using this island that the Russians used to use for nuclear testing for a big <laughs> portion of the action. Um, and I figured it's a nuclear testing island. There's like this on this giant island. There's like a thousand people, and they're all military personnel on a weather station and a little base. So I'm thinking I'm pretty safe if I get facts wrong. <laughs> and yet you know that that. So I use the place where I can cheat for this one. There, there will be that one reviewer on Amazon <laughs> who gives you the one star because oh, yeah. you got the street name on that island wrong. <laughs> oh, guaranteed. Guaranteed. I will find the guy. Um, and we are very grateful to those better. people. <laughs> oh, I did a book tour this year. You guys know because you paid for it. But uh, <laughs> I went to Europe and uh, immediately came back from um, Europe and changed a whole bunch of things in Alliance of Shadows. Um, because I had just been to Paris, and we had a big chunk of the book that takes place in Paris. And so the whole time I was there was just research, basically. Yeah. And I got to change a lot of things and make a lot of scenes more realistic and more lively and was able to kind of get the feel down a little better. And that was a lot of fun. 
good. be able to do that. Good. So, Let's talk just a little bit about centers. Um, you know, I know that John uh, wrote it, uh, and as you say in the introduction, you you edited a, a really fun story. But um, tell us a little bit about the the book. Sure. Um, so the main character is uh, is the same as in uh, Grunge. It's a guy named Chad. He is um, a U.S. Marine who was blown up in the Beirut uh, bombing. And basically, given a uh, opportunity to return to life by Saint Peter, in well, we assume it's Saint Peter, uh, and that he will get to you know do some very important things. He uh, he does have some some gifts. I'd say some spiritual gifts. There, he's a uh, he's better with languages than anybody else we've ever had in the Monster Hunter universe, and uses that at times um, to understand things that no one else can. Um, He's a short little super cocky womanizer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now one of the things people need to remember about the memoirs novels, okay, so the regular books are written straight up as this is a narrative of things that happened. They're, they're in the first person or in the third person, but, you know, it's a reliable narrator. The thing to keep in mind about the memoirs is they are memoirs. They're written by a guy about his adventures. And the idea is, we, you know, they've... Monster Hunter National, they have found these years later, and we're reading. So so it is, a, it is an unreliable narrator, and it's Chad talking about his adventures. So you just need to kind of keep that in mind at time, um, that you're reading about, this is this guy's take on events. And uh, he's, a, he's an interesting character. He's a fun character. Uh, does a lot of stuff. And also another thing, too, is they're not written like a, like a straight-up, uh, uh, story with we're following the plot from A to B to C. This is the, this guy's life experiences and what he learned from them, and he's writing them down for other people. So yeah, there is a plot. Um, I mean, there is a plot, and there is an overall arcing uh, villain um, for these three books. But um, but we're coming at it from a perspective. This is this guy's journal, basically. This is his lessons learned. It's and, a uh, lot of unrelenting action, that's for sure. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, the, the action's pretty much nonstop. It's uh, a John writes action differently than I do. I mean, he tackles it a different way, so they're a different perspective, different uh, way of reading. The, I mean, different look at the monster in the world. But yeah, they're busy. Um, this guy goes from one of the busiest places into the company to another place that is now the busiest place in the company. And uh, a big part of this of sinners is just them trying to backfill. And uh, be able to, to be ready for the next, basically it's every full moon just keeps getting more and more ridiculous. And it's these guys trying to, to deal with it. And then the next book really is them figuring out why uh, New Orleans has gotten the way it's gotten. And uh, so, yeah, tons of action. Lots and lots of action. Well, um, Chad has several weapons in centers, uh, but the two that, that come up a lot are this Barrett 50 caliber uh, machine gun and his samurai sword. Oh, no, okay, okay. So that's a gun that I actually do know a lot about. And so John used the book. I, I tweaked a lot of um, scenes in, in the, the book with the Barrett because uh, well, I used to have a Barrett M82 in my gun store, and I've shot one a ton. Um, and I've done range day demos <laughs> with them, so I've seen various people. So I had one scene where he was sitting on the hood of a car and he had him shoot it, and I was like, oh, dude, you're going to, like, if that thing is waxed, you're going right off the back. <laughs> he's a little dude. Yeah, I'm six foot five, three hundred, and so back, I used to shoot this thing offhand for demos. And I, you know, the hard thing is not the recoil of this fifty cal rifle because the recoil is about like a twelve gauge slug hmm. uh, out of a you know pretty lightweight shotgun. But it's that it's so heavy that you kind of have to put your body at awkward angles to shoot it. And so what happens is it's so muzzle heavy, it's really hard to aim offhand. It's meant to be shot from the prone, and so Chad is like half my size. And, uh, you know, I could lean in and really control this thing, but I'm thinking Chad's half my side. He had the scene where he's shooting the mole rat sitting on the hood of, a, of his car. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're coming off. <laughs> <laughs> you're sliding. You're, your happy ass is going to slide right off that car when you try shooting that thing sitting up. So uh, well, but the M82 is a fun gun. Well, uh, one, one of the nice things about this is the, the, the bromance between Chad and Milo. Um, oh yeah, that, that was that was one that I I, um, I did actually contribute a lot on because Milo's you know character of my invention. But 
in the series, we've seen Milo as like this older, experienced, senior level hunter. Right. Right. But but back in the 1980s, he is this. I think he's 17 when the book because he he got recruited young because his family got massacred, uh, and he was a sole survivor and he just kind of like tagged along with Monster Hunter after that because the guy is a mechanical genius even at a young age. Mm-hmm. But uh, so it was actually kind of fun to have. Uh, Milo this as this hyperactive uh, junior monster hunter uh, and you can see glimpses of, of the brilliance <laughs> of the future but he's he's squirrely as all get out and there's a sequence of these two guys of Chad and Milo uh, partnered up <laughs> in zombies at a golf course uh-huh it's actually one of my favorite parts of the book yeah me too um, me too yeah, and I, I really I love that scene just because it, it's not like a big dangerous threat or anything. It's by these guys' standards a pretty mild thing, but it's just these guys being doofuses to each other, and uh, you know Milo trying to shoot from the vehicle while Chad's rocking the car, <laughs> <laughs> so we can blame it on Milo's marksmanship, and then Milo tying his shoelaces together when Chad takes a nap. <laughs> and just, I really like the when, most dangerous uh... thing being out there is being golf balls. You know, getting hit by a straight golf ball, not being bit by a zombie. <laughs> when they're backing up uh, in in uh, Chad's car, Milo's at the wheel, and uh, they're backing away from some huge threat, and and Milo decides to stop at a stop sign. Is... <laughs> yeah. well, and well, then there's Milo's a minivan from rural there. Idaho, right? What's that? Oh, he's from he, Milo. Milo is from rural Idaho, and. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, he's from farm country, right? And so he's driving. He's not a, he's not a speedy driver. <laughs> he's, actually a, he's actually a considerate driver. Uh, you know, this kid grew up driving tractors, right? And so he is not the guy you want driving your vehicle at this point in time. You know, he's not the guy you want driving a vehicle during your high-speed chase with a monster trying to kill you. <laughs> uh, so he had some good bits about Milo's grandma driving but you know i i i think these scenes are also um they're 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 indicative of 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 how what we were talking about earlier when how people deal with stress um and and the sort of gallows humor um that emerges from that so uh but they're just you know they're just a a ton of fun to read so um i i I want to just get in a quick mention since we are at the the gift giving season um there is a signature line of um Rifles, I believe. Oh, yeah. Um, so I partnered up with uh, JP Enterprises, which is a, a high-end custom AR-15 manufacturer. Um, they make the top-of-the-line competition guns uh, for three-gun competition, and they do a lot of long-range precision stuff. And I was on book tour up in Minneapolis, and uh, they, they are out in Hugo, Minnesota. Mm. It turns out I have a bunch of fans that work there. And so they're like, you need to come to our factory and shoot all our guns. And I already knew their stuff because I, I come from a competition shooting background. I love JP Enterprise's stuff. And so uh, I took a trip out there and uh, spent the day at the factory shooting guns. And they were like, we need to build guns for you. <laughs> we need to do a monster hunter gun. And I was like, oh, heck yeah. Totally. <laughs> totally. And the cool part is in Monster Hunter Siege, um, I've got a part where Owen uh, has to go to work in a place that's uh, it's, it's mostly long range shooting and so his regular gun is Abomination which is a 12 gauge shotgun mm-hmm. um, which would be pretty much useless at the range as he's having to engage stuff so he needs a rifle and so we actually the rifle that Owen is using in that book we actually built and uh, it's for sale <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's called the, it's, it's the JP Enterprise it's, it's the Casador. It's the JP Casador, and so you can actually get that. Or uh, it's an expensive gun. Don't get me wrong, because it's like I said, it's Owen's gun. Owen makes a lot of money, and I I went kind of whole hog on this thing. I went all nuts, and I have one. I I got one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, what, what they also do is if you want to, if you want the, they'll engrave the Monster Hunter International logo or the Monster Control Bureau logo on any of their guns, or nice. any of their regular guns, or just the lower receiver which is kind of fun. Um, so I know that they've, they've, they've done a bunch of those for people and uh, that's, that's pretty neat. So yeah, I, it's not just enough for me to write about guns. I have to actually build my character's guns so I can have them. 
<laughs> oh, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to be the author. <laughs> well, you know, research, research. Because I'm not a long range shooting guy. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. I mean, I did three gun competition, but that usually tops at about 500 yards at most, right? Yeah. Um, well, the next regular Monster Hunter book that I'm doing with Sarah Hoyt is Monster Hunter Guardian. Mm-hmm. And that's the Julie Shackleford novel. Julie, uh, her thing is precision. She's a precision. Uh, she's a precision uh, marksman. Yes. Team sniper. And um, so I'm actually going to uh, New Mexico uh, once it warms up, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go take a class with some of the best rifle shooters in the country um, for doing a thousand yard class. Great. And the reason I'm doing this is specifically just so I can write all the Julie uh, with Guardian. I basically told Sarah, don't worry about the shooting bits when you're writing it. Just kind of leave that blank. I'll, I <laughs> Get that done. I am, yeah. I am sending myself on the shooting training world tour so I can make sure I get all this stuff right. <laughs> now, uh, I, now, I know your wife, Bridget, okay, perks. I know your wife, Bridget, is also interested in a tank. So, uh, you'll, 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 now, you'll have... You know, that's a, that, that, oh, so I love tanks. I, I, I am, like I said, I'm six foot five, though. I can never actually, you know, fit in very few of them. But um, a couple of years ago, we were just kind of on the internet, and I saw this British Challenger tank had come up for sale. And I was like, oh, I wonder what tanks, you know, go for. I looked, and they cost the same as sports cars. Mm. And I was like, tanks are way cooler than sports cars. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm like, I started, so I started looking up what tanks go for, and I'm like, I could buy a tank. <laughs> and so it kind of became this running thing in our family that we decided we're going to buy a tank. Um, just because, you know. Why not? <laughs> you can own a tank. <laughs> so well, we'll we'll wait uh, for next year when the uh, the the Monster Hunter uh, tank line is is released. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually do use a tank for the first time in the series in the, in the new one. Uh-huh. We've got a scene where they and it's actually a Czech tank because it's from the that's from the the team from the Czech Republic, the, mm-hmm. their their company, um, which was because I was doing a book signing in the Czech Republic earlier, and they're like, you have never used us. We love your books. And I was like, I was like, I will remedy that. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Czech team actually has a tank. It's a, uh, it's a T-72M. And uh, we, have a, we have a scene with a tank versus a giant is what happens. And uh, it was pretty cool. So I, I, I got to, you know, use a little bit of my tank research. <laughs> And I will say too that the uh, uh, the the Czech Republic has been a great consumer of Bane books in general. Um, they uh, oh, they love David Weber. They love David oh. Weber. They 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 love a lot of our line, and uh, we, we yeah, they they I mean, they're great people. I love it. I had so much fun visiting. Um, we were there for four days, and people were wonderful, and they do love Bane books, and they huge number of Monster Hunter fans. Biggest book signings I've ever had. Um, and they treat writers like rock stars there. They, uh, I mean, they, they seriously, we, we get like movie star treatment. Wow. <laughs> That's great. People were coming up to me in the bathroom with glossy photographs that they had printed off for me to sign. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it was crazy. We had lines out the door. I do get to have a scene with a tank. <laughs> great. Great. Well, tell us, since you're dropping hints, um, tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. The What's the next entry in the Mainline series? Sure. It's called Monster Hunter Siege. Um, a lot of people thought the next one was Monster Hunter Guardian. That's not. That's the one after. Uh, that's number seven. This is number six, uh, Monster Hunter Siege. And it picks up right after the events of uh, Monster Hunter Legion and Monster Hunter Nemesis, where we had lost several hunters, had been uh, left behind. Uh, after the events in Las Vegas, basically these guys have been sucked into another dimension. Uh, they believe they're dead, but uh, as Agent Franks reveals in Monster Hunter Nemesis, there's a possibility they're still alive. Uh, this book is back to Owen's perspective. He follow, He's kind of driven on this because it's the first time he's lost people that were under his command. Um, so he's doing everything he can to try to get these people back if possible. And uh, it takes them on kind of this big epic journey, which goes from being a little rescue mission to the biggest um, biggest monster hunting operation in history, um, where they basically get all the different companies they made friends with in Las Vegas that, during the events of Monster Hunter Legion, and they put together this, this massive um, invasion force, and I don't want to give too much away, 
but the the siege part, it's not the good guys that are under attack. It's the good guys who are on the offensive. Mm. Uh, they're laying siege to this place, which is known colloquially as the city of monsters. And um, it's it's pretty awesome. And so it's just, uh, they just get to go whole hog. And it, it, the whole operation is very expensive, and it's funded by a certain uh, character who I introduced before, who a lot of people were asking me if, uh, oh, I, can't, I don't want to give too much away. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I get excited. But, uh, well, you were talking about some of the weapons that come up. So there's a tank. Oh, gosh. We, well, and I, I, mean, I, I got to finalize a few things because I was trying to – I do my homework, and I was trying to figure out what kind, how many armored vehicles I can fit on a car hauler. <laughs> mm. on, on, a, on one of those um, uh, flat bottom boats they use for the, the river travel. I haven't, I haven't nailed down exactly everything yet, um, but they bring everything in the kitchen sink, and uh, it's ridiculous, and they spend a lot of money. Well, keep in mind, Earl is 100. Earl's over 100 years old, and he discovered the joys of compound interest a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so Earl, Earl's doing okay. Um, I, actually, because back in Alpha, I, I put the part that Earl, you know, had a place up in Alaska. Uh, it's really big, <laughs> and so that becomes their the they they call it the, the the Monster Hunter International Cold Weather Training Facility, i.e., Earl Harbinger's camp uh, for miscreant youth. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's awesome. So no, they build a basically a Monster Hunter tent city up there to get ready. It's it's pretty fun. This, um, is, this is sounding a lot like uh, I'm getting shades of Lois Bujold here. You know, the joy of logistics. So yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I try, I try to. I'm an accountant, so I try not to bog down too much on that. But yeah, no. I mean, part of it too is like I can't just do anything. I have to be able to figure out how how the world we would pay for it. Um, I do still need to do a bunch of research. I got to bring in some Navy types because I have a couple parts where we have a a naval landing. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, so I picked a, I picked one of the minor Monster Hunter characters who I've talked about before, but I've never really used them on screen much, mm -hmm. uh, who is a former naval officer. But uh, she was on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> so this part where they expect her to crash a boat up onto a beach, you know, she's yelling at Earl over the radio. It's like, you know, Earl, I don't know how to do that. I, <laughs> I was on an aircraft carrier. I would have I got – admirals don't like it when you park – <laughs> aircraft carriers on the beach so nah, we, we we it's just pretty fun yeah i'm pretty excited i think you guys are gonna like it great so do you have a um timeline already worked out of how you want the books to go or um to what extent are things already outlined um i've actually got the overall overarching plot um as far as like the owen storyline with the big bad guy which this this book we get to actually finally meet the big bad guy um and uh, I have, I've had that plan for a long time. But what happened was several years ago, I was either going to write Monster Hunter Legion or Monster Hunter Alpha. And, I, you know, and that was where I would veer off to other characters. And so I went to Tony and I said, hey, Tony, would you like me to do the next book in the series I have planned? Or would you like an Earl Harbinger book, like a, like a, like a veer off to the side spinoff book? And Tony said, Earl, Earl, Earl. <laughs> and uh, that was so popular that I started inserting basically every other book would be from somebody else's perspective. And so did that, that kind of opened it up. So right now I don't know how any more remain exactly because I keep having good ideas. Um, oh, no. But there is an end in sight. But I do have a plan. Yeah. And the the Owen books you write first person, right? And the others are uh, third person viewpoint usually, right? I, I believe so. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of how I did it because I, I like switching back and forth. I don't like getting bogged down in just one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I like mixing it up. So Owen books tend to be first person, though I do cheat and and uh, and and find different ways to tell other people's stories in there too. Usually, hey, magic, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but then when we then when John, uh, then when Ringo did these memoirs books, so all of a sudden that opened up all sorts of other possibilities too, of telling stories from other people's perspectives in the same universe. Um, so I would love in the future to do more memoirs books with, uh, you know, with other writers too. And cool. really, 
get this thing huge. And then, then we did the book of short stories, the anthology of short stories, which I, I know, Tony, you, you've read that now, right? Have you, have you seen the final for that? I have read your story and I think uh, Jim's story, Jim Butcher's story. Jim yeah. Butcher's? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Butcher's story is great. Yeah. Well, I, it's awesome. Um, so we did the anthology and we had a ton of different authors come in on that. And I'm reading through this and I'm like, man, there are so many creative people who wanted to play in this world. So, gosh, I don't know how many stories we could tell, honestly. Um, as long as people keep reading them, I guess I'll keep writing them. <laughs> that, 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 that's a deal, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, a, you have the super active fan community at your website. Um, do you, and speaking of your readers, uh, do you draw energy from all these folks? It, it seems like you really do. Um, oh, yeah. I, I, I actually love my fans. I truly love them. Um, don't get me wrong. Sometimes my fans drive me nuts. <laughs> but, no, my fans are amazing. I have got the coolest fans in the world, and I truly love them. And I, I, hope, I hope they get it. I'm not just blowing smoke when I say that. I really do think they're amazing people. And uh, I have been really blessed. I mean, and so I've got thousands of just really neat fans that, They'll, they, they will try, they will read anything that I put out just because they, they trust me. And my goal is always to never let them down. You know, I always, always want to, if I keep those guys happy, you know, I'm doing my job. So, but they're fun. I, I got super fun fans. And uh, they're a little scary at times. Um, how, how many guns have you had to sign at uh, book signings? Hundreds. <laughs> um, I've signed everything. I my fan base, I have so many veterans in my fan base that if there is ever anything I want to know about any topic, uh, all I got to do is go out there and go, hey, do I have somebody who did X? And I'll have 14 people. Like, yep, I'm in. <laughs> How can I help? <laughs> you know, one time I had, uh, I was writing a little story and part of it was set at Quantico in the Marine base. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to make sure that I had gotten my stuff right um, for the short story. And I threw it out on Facebook. And I said, hey, I need Marines that served at Quantico in the last 10 years. Uh, just to read this. I had 40 volunteers in a half an hour. Wow. And uh, I was like, well, I can't do that because then, um, you know, then there won't be anybody left to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, oh, and they're charitable, too. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, okay, so we call, I call them the Monster Hunter Nation. And... Uh, Every now and then I'll find some charity thing that, that I want to help out with. And all I've got to do is throw it out there to these guys. And they are so generous and they are so motivated. They just jump on it. Like we did a thing a couple years ago. I, I, I did a thing where I took charity red shirts where it was, you know, donate some money and I will use your name in a book. Um, I couldn't even promise that you would, you know, wind up as a big character. You might just be like in the background mentioned once then die. <laughs> or, you know, just mention once and never seen again. But we, we raised so much money that we wound up paying for this kid's kidney dialysis, and a local kid. We paid for his kidney dialysis until he was able to get a transplant. That's fantastic. We five books to uh, get through all those names. And so I finally got through. And so with the last, the last guy went into Monster Hunter Seeds. And so it was time to do it again. And so a friend of mine has spina bifida. Um, and he had just a series of surgeries. It's been really tough on him. And he, he was in the hole, had a bunch of medical bills to pay. Um, so we threw it out there. I was doing the red shirting in one day, one day we raised 20 grand, which was what he needed to get out of the hole. And, uh, I now have enough names that I am probably good for the next five years. Again. <laughs> cool. cool. Uh, what is the name of the anthology that's or coming up? Oh, uh, uh I don't, the, uh, the, I think we're calling it the Monster Hunter Files. Yeah. I, yep. I, I believe that's what we're calling it. It'd be like, so we've got memoirs, our, our spinoff books, and then we've got files or short stories. So, well, um, I think, I think, I thought that, I think that's what we decided on. Yep. Which is funny because I'm putting together a collection of my short stories for you guys, and we haven't come up with a title for that yet because. I suck at titles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to work on that. On this one. We, we, we will have to work on that. I'm really good at books, terrible at naming them. I think half my books, half my books she has named. <laughs> well, wait, 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 hang on. Tony Daniel, you named, you were the guy that came up with Alliance Shadows, weren't you? 
Yeah, and Son of the Black Sword. <laughs> oh, no, see, so it's not just Tony Westcoff here. She's like, Bayon has named half my books. <laughs> Man, I couldn't think of a name for Son of the Black Sword forever. Ooh, that was a, that was a killer. That's all right. I, that I, was, I, I don't write the books. <laughs> Well, I'm just not good at names. Well, and you guys are good at names and marketing. It's funny because uh, on that one, I think the word file for the longest time was like Larry's Epic Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> you which, know? Which, while descriptive, is, is not really evocative. So, <laughs> Yeah, super evocative. Let's just put it. I was thinking for the Larry Korea short story collection, it'd just be like face punch with an exclamation point. And uh, <laughs> hmm. no, I'm, hmm. I'm bad at it. <laughs> He's not a good title guy. All right, I I I get the feel you're going for though. I'll 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 start I'll I will start thinking about that. So. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I don't know. We'll think of something. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. You write them. Cool. Okay, yeah. I'll keep I'll keep writing them. You guys keep naming them. <laughs> yeah. Sinners and Saints weren't. Uh, those weren't the original names of those either. No, they weren't. Um, I. Uh... I changed them. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's why. That's why you guys. That's why you guys are the editors. But... <laughs> they. They. They were. They were a little too uh, artsy fartsy for me. The original. The original title. So, we just went for one words. That worked. Well, because the running joke in my family, because like I, I, I came up with Monster Hunter Siege, but I, we were. Sitting around, I think all the Monster Hunter ones I've named, but we were sitting around um, one night at dinner trying to come up with names. I tell, Basically, I tell my kids the plot, and then we try to come up with the names. But the running joke of my family is the Monster Hunter series is Monster Hunter Strong Word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except it's two words. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's got to be something, you know, you know something we- cool like Vendetta, Legion, Nemesis, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, I, so, so, when I run out of, when I run out of strong words, that's that's when it's time to uh, end the series. <laughs> you, you have to be able to imagine Bruce Willis saying it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you know, then you know it's awesome. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Monster Hunter Lawnmower. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, not not strong. It needs to be like invincible. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's good. It's got to be able to go in like a Dodge truck commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Monster Hunter Semi or Hemi. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pick up car magazines and look for words when they talk about powerful engines. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't care where the title comes from. <laughs> well, uh, the book is the book that's out right now is Monster Hunter Memoir Sinners. Named by Tony Weiskopf, but written by Larry Korea and John Ringa. It's now available at booksellers everywhere. Larry and Tony, thank you all for, for being with us here on the podcast. Th- th- thanks for writing Hurt on us, Tony. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Always fun. Now we continue with our complete Audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy, The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Chapter 21 Brotherhood on Corsera They're coming out of the manor, Tovera said. They've seen us, they're coming over. Adele reduced her data unit's display. She couldn't shut down and turned. She was sitting on a block of the tumbled railing at the northwest corner of the plaza. 
the corner to the south had been carved away by the first of the missiles which destroyed the Gulkinder Palace. The transmitted shock had been enough to damage the other end of the retaining wall also. Daniel and Hogg came toward them across the plaza, picking their way over the tilting blocks with the effortless assurance of water finding a level. Adele waved. She didn't have to call attention to herself as she had thought she might need to do. Daniel hadn't been expecting to see her, but it was polite. It was one of the things human beings did to show that they were pleased by the company of other human beings. Adele glanced at Tovera and said, You're a good role model. Tovera smiled faintly but said nothing. Besides the toppled railing, there were other reminders of the brief coup, or of the counter-coup, depending on how you wanted to describe the process by which Colonel Murciello had returned command of the garrison to Colonel Bourbon. There was enough powdered stone in the air, lifted by breezes, to make the back of Adele's throat feel dry and itchy. Much worse were the clawing, sickening combustion products of the propellant, which had been sprayed over a wide area before it ignited. Anti-ship missiles used boron fuel to get maximum acceleration. The residues were poisonous, though at the present dilution they wouldn't be an acute problem. Adele smiled wryly. She didn't expect to die of emphysema. Daniel put his foot on the base of the fallen stone banister, which had once supported part of the railing, on which Adele sat. He stared down what was nearly a perpendicular cliff for the first twenty feet, and a stiff slope for the next twenty feet also. RCN midshipmen accompanied the riggers as part of their duties, so it wasn't likely that an officer who had risen to the rank of captain would be troubled by vertigo. Daniel turned and seated himself on the block beside Adele's. Hogg and Tovera were facing outward some six feet away from their principals, watching other people on the plaza. I've been talking with Colonel Bourbon, he said, looking toward the main stream of the Cephasis well to the east. He's doubtful, but he's willing to support my plan for the time being. In return, he'd like my help in getting fair benefits for his personnel. Benefits, Adele said. Bourbon is aware that an independent Coursera will have very little need for a standing army, Daniel said, even without the general popular dislike of the garrison. Murciello may have thought he could rule by force, but Bourbon is smarter than that. The miners are mostly armed by this time. His laugh had a harsh undertone. I don't think Bourbon really has the stomach to try that either, he said. But that's a separate question. Still, he doesn't want to see his people dumped in the street after the Pantelarians are gone, dumped or massacred. I see, said Adele. That problem was now being considered in the back of her mind. She had a more immediate concern, however. Daniel, she said. I need to enter Hablinger to meet a man. I hope you have some suggestions. The Kaisha could do that, but I would like to return to Brotherhood afterward as well. Could you get me into Hablinger without being noticed by the Independence forces? Not directly, Daniel said. He didn't ask why she wanted to meet a man in Hablinger. Now it's possible that we might be able to meet an incoming ship above Corsera and transfer you to it. The only ships bound for Hablinger are Pantelarian and in convoy. So that would mean intercepting a normal copper trader and bribing her to take you into Hablinger instead, which we could do, though I'm not sure about timing, or... He pursed his lips as he calculated mentally. I would be staring at my display, Adele thought. We could lift for Pantelaria and put you on a ship there, Daniel continued. They wouldn't think anything in Brotherhood about a Pantelarian ship landing in Hablinger. And of course, they couldn't track us from the ground. That would work. I need to be in Hablinger within three days, Adele said. I'm sorry, I should have said that. If you get us to the independent side, Master, Hogg said, sidling closer but continuing to face outward. I can get her through the Pantelarian lines, unless you're fussy about a sentry or two, Mistress. I don't care about that. Adele said curtly. Daniel, will Colonel Bourbon give us his support? Because we'll need at least neutrality from independence forces at the point we set out from. I'm sure Bourbon would, Daniel said. But I suggest we discuss matters first with Brother Graves. The transformationist segment of the siege lines is immediately to the west of the Cephasis Channel, which I think would be a good location. That's the way I think, too, Hogg said, nodding his head enthusiastically. I've been looking at the satellite feeds all the time we've been back on Coursera. 
I figured there'd be more ways to get into the city than a couple thousand screaming idiots charging across the fields in broad daylight like last time. Yes, I think that too, said Daniel, grinning. But as to Adele's matter, Brother Graves is alone in brotherhood. I trust Colonel Bourbon, but I don't trust all the people around him to keep their mouths shut. We can't afford to have the Pantelarians learn about this. He paused. Adele saw his face change, though not in any fashion she could have described with certainty. Unless, Daniel said, the Pantelarians are expecting you. They're not, said Adele. Not even the person I need to see. She coughed to put an end to the subject. I've met Graves, she said. I can talk with him myself, but it might be better if you joined me to explain exactly what is required. I'm out of my depth here. No problem, said Daniel. We can go to his office immediately, though it'll be roundabout because there's a large hole where Ridge Road used to join the plaza. One thing, Hogg said. He looked at Adele. Tavera's going to have to watch my young master while I'm gone. It's going to be like having a log chained to my leg, dragging you through the lines. I won't guarantee how quick I can do it, so she's got to be responsible here. All three of them looked at Tovera. Tovera turned with a lopsided smile. And you don't want to haul a second log around, hey? She said. Well, I can see that. But bring her back, right? Right, said Hogg, meeting Tovera's eyes. She comes back, or nobody does. His expression might have been meant for a smile. Which is how it was going to be anyway, Hogg added. Now let's go find Brother Graves so we can be done with this crap quick. Daniel stepped aside at the head of the stairs so that Hogg could reach the top, but he let Adele approach the door of Graves' office alone. Mistress, said Tovera urgently, it isn't latched. No, said Adele. She rapped on the door jamb with the knuckles of her right hand. Come in, a male voice called. It's open. Daniel felt himself relax and frowned because he had been anything but relaxed. The door was closed, but not pulled quite to, something everyone did occasionally. Since it wasn't an outside door which the wind might blow open, there was no reason to worry about it. Unless you were a paranoid sociopath like Tovera. Was there another person like Tovera? Adele pushed the door fully open and entered an ordinary office. Rickard Cleveland and an older man, presumably Graves, were standing on chairs as they replaced the glass in a window casement. Both panes had cracked across diagonally. Ceiling plaster had fallen in the corner beyond them. Someone had swept it up, but the chunks waited in a wastebasket to be dumped. I'm sorry about the mess, Lady Mundy, Graves said, stepping down carefully. The excitement yesterday made the building flex a little. The disadvantage of building on bedrock is that anything that happens to the bedrock is transmitted at full strength. He laid his utility knife on the desk and walked around it, holding his hand out to Daniel. And you would be Captain Leary, Graves said. It's an honor to meet you, sir. I'm Dalit Graves, as I suppose you know. Ah, would you care to sit down? I can bring a chair out of the bedroom. Our servants will stand, Daniel said. He supposed that made him sound like the stern master of storybooks, and of no few noble townhouses, though in the country things were more relaxed. I thought they might, said Graves with a sort of smile. He pulled the chairs from under the window, sitting in one and gesturing Cleveland into the other. Now, Graves continued, please explain what you want from me, Captain, and I'll do my best to provide it. The transformationist community is in your debt for removing Colonel Murciello. In fact, all brotherhood is, despite the occasional cracked window. Graves had understood that Hogg and Tovera were bodyguards, which Rickard Cleveland didn't appear to have done, despite being in close contact with them on the voyage from Cinnabar. It would be wrong to think of Graves as a dreamy religious nut. Captain, said Cleveland. His hands rested on the back of the indicated chair, but he hadn't sat down. If you'd prefer that I leave, I won't be offended. Daniel had been on the fence about asking Cleveland to go. The volunteered offer convinced him that it wasn't necessary. Please stay, Master Cleveland, he said, taking the chair facing the desk. Adele was already in the one against the wall, immersed in the display of her data unit. 
though of course the operation depends on keeping the discussion among ourselves. The operation and lives depend on secrecy. Daniel coughed. Basically, we intend to put an agent into Hablinger, he said. We'd like to do it through the transformationist positions in the siege line because your contingent is relatively small. Also, I believe your people are more trustworthy than those of other elements in the coalition. He grinned and added, I suppose that sounds as though I'm buttering you up. Yes, said Graves, it does. But I also believe it's objectively true, as I suspect you do, Captain. Of course I'll help you. Would you like me to accompany you north and speak to our field commander, Brother Heimholtz? Do you think that would be necessary? Daniel said. The possibility hadn't crossed his mind. I was hoping for a letter of introduction, so to speak. I believe our communications, mine that is, said Graves, between here and both the field and Pearl Valley are reasonably secure. They are, said Adele, without looking up from her display. Secure from any Pantelarian on the planet at present, at least. I was more concerned with the other factions in the Independence Coalition, to be honest, Graves said with a smile. But I suppose those risks aren't as great with Colonel Bourbon back in charge. And I'm glad to know that the Pantelarians aren't reading our messages, not that they would find much to interest them. If you just send a note saying that we'll be arriving probably tomorrow, Daniel said, I would appreciate it. A general note like that wouldn't be a problem even if it did get out. Of course, Graves said. Brother Heimholtz runs a tight ship, or whatever metaphor would be proper. He's a former captain in the land forces of the Republic, and he rose from the ranks to a commission during the recent war. Graves tented his fingers before him and looked at them. I think Heimholtz may have a more difficult task than I do, he said. The common soldiers of our contingent are rotated back to Pearl Valley every three months, but Brother Heimholtz remains where he is, both for continuity of command and because he's really the only member of our community who has the expertise. It's very hard for one of us, a brother, to be responsible for slaughter. Brother Heimholtz lives with the community, Cleveland said. You have nothing, no one. Then fiercely he added, I don't know how you stand it. I've only been a member for two years, and even so the separation of returning to Cinnabar was, was... He smiled wryly. It's good that I've stopped drinking, he said, his voice mild again. I was an unpleasant drunk, and I would have stayed very drunk. I'm doing it for the cause, Graves said with a lopsided grin to show that he was joking. He wasn't joking, of course. I'm surprised that the transformationists, Daniel's mind had toyed with you cultists, but there was no risk that would reach his tongue. Would be so strongly for Corsairan independence. You don't seem to be a very political group. Cleveland looked blank. So did Graves for a moment, but then the older man chuckled. I was unclear, Captain, Graves said, and I apologize. Yes, we're an apolitical group as a general matter. Our involvement in the independence movement is simply because we fear that the circumstances attending a return to Pantelarian rule would be non-survivable. He cleared his throat, then said, The cause to which I referred is the transformation of men as individual thinkers to men as aspects of a single social mind. That, Daniel said. He didn't know how to go on, so he stopped. I do not expect this to occur within my lifetime, said Graves, smiling. And perhaps it won't occur within the lifetime of the universe. Still, it's the cause for which we strive. As before, he wasn't joking. Daniel rose to his feet. I'm not a religious man, Brother Graves, he said. But your religion is one I can honor from a distance. Graves stood also. I'll tell the field force to expect you, Captain he said. And I assure you that craftsmanship at the level you and your companions demonstrated. He nodded not only to Adele, joining Daniel at the door, but to Hog and Tovera as well. Has my full appreciation also. May mankind be better for your efforts? Yes, said Daniel as he led the way out of the room. We can all hope that. His own goals were shorter term, but that was a worthy sentiment.
That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Bain publisher Tony Weiskopf for being with us, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a Mardi Gras float made of bacon, machine guns, and D&D miniatures, as well as the thanks and gratitude of a monstrously huge nation to Larry Correa, co-author with John Ringo of Monster Hunter Memoirs Centers. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 